Let us pray. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob of Isaiah, God of Amos and Micah, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and of his followers, disciples and apostles, God whose being of justice, righteousness and love has been reflected in all who have known you throughout all generations. We bring you our praise today. Grant that we might bring to fruition those qualities in our lives and be known as those who produce the fruits of the kingdom, the fruits of fair dealing, forgiveness and compassion and care. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. I do welcome you, brothers and sisters, uh, to this very important session where I would ask you to listen very carefully to the word of God being read and listen to the sharing of the word of God. I, I think you get something that will help you in your journey as a Christian and in your journey as you are moving forward. God bless you. Amen. I would ask Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the word of God from the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Praise God. Oh, thank, thank you for all tuning in this morning and coming to hear Johnson and the word of the Lord being spoken. And uh, I suggest that if you haven't watched all the YouTubes, that you go back and watch a few of the other ones to eat. But anyway, as Johnson mentioned, I'll be reading from Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. And it's about the song of the vineyard. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard and that I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I'll tell you, what am I going to do with my vineyard? I'll take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its walls and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and, briars and thorns will grow here. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vineyard vines he delighted in. And he took he and he looked for justice but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. Praise God. Well, we'll get Johnson back to share the word of the Lord with us this week and bring open ears as usual. Praise God. Thanks, Johnson. Uh, <clears throat> I'm back. I just want to thank God for allowing me to share the word of God. And um, my theme this morning is learning to maximize your potential. Learning to maximize your potential. Uh, there is a book about uh, the tale of two trees and uh, two flowers, the tale of two flowers. And uh, it says, once upon a time, two beautiful flowers lived side by side in a very magnificent garden. One was bright yellow and the other was bright blue. From the first moments of their existence, these two flowers received a lot of false praise from the world for their vigor and beauty. I love your face, said the sun to the yellow flower. I love your eyes, said the sky to the blue flower. 
I love your overall beauty, said the butterfly. I love your pollen, said the bee. And I love your nectar, said an ant. I love the shade that you provide, said the grasshopper. The two flowers basket in their glory and all the clothes they received. Never stop, they said to the world. <clears throat> One day the yellow flower began to do some work. What are you doing? Asked the blue flower. I'm making pollen. She answered, you don't be doing. You shouldn't be doing that. It will make you old before your time. The yellow flower did not heed the warning, but continued to make her pollen. The next day, the blue flower was complimented by the sky, but the sun said nothing to the yellow flower, which seemed a bit withered and worn. What did I tell you? said the blue flower. You must spend all your time making yourself beautiful, and no one in the future will care about you. The blue flower primed her petals and primed their color. The yellow flower was constant to make pollen. Several days later, a young man was strolling through the garden. He spied the blue flower and picked it up. This must come to my house, he said. What did I tell you, said the blue flower to the yellow flower. Now I will adorn this man's house while you will sit in this hot sun and will. In time, when the man was finished with the blue flower, he discarded it into the fire. In time, when nature had finished with the yellow flower, there was a whole field of yellow blossoms. This delightful but very challenging story contrasts what happened to those who are prepared and those who are complacent. It is also a tale which demonstrates how different people respond to the gift given to them by God. Some use gifts wisely and produce an abundance, while others pass up opportunity or use very minimal or unwisely the gifts and possibilities God sends our way. Today's reading from the prophet Isaiah, known as the Song of the Vineyard, illustrates the failure of the people of Judah to use wisely what God has given them and the consequent results that come from such an abuse of God's gifts. And in metaphorical language, Isaiah summarizes that all that God had done to date in salvation history to make the land of Judah a fruitful place and a great nation. Using the image of the people of Isaiah as a vineyard, the prophet says that God did everything possible for the people. God placed the people in a very fertile land, a place, as scriptures say, that flowed milk and honey. That is why where the people were. God cleared away all the stones from his land. That is the peoples of the region who would not allow Israel to grow and flourish. God gave the people the law to show them how to live their lives by the loving God and neighbor. The people were special, even unique to Yahweh. They were a singular group, a chosen vine that God planted to nourish, to produce a rich harvest. In order to accomplish this, God sent judges, kings, and finally prophets to govern and assist the people to proclaim God's word to them. Even with all this, however, the fruits of the vineyard, that is the works of the Hebrews, were not good. On the contrary, the vineyard produced wild grapes. God expected more from his chosen people. What more could the Lord have done? You can hear him showing... <coughs> that and saying it. The Hebrews did not use the gifts they had been given wisely. They had the land, they had the law, they had the special protection of God. They were given all they could possibly need. Although the people were special to God and were granted opportunities, gifts and talents, the people made poor choices. They chose the other gods their religious leaders exercised their world of power and authority wrongly and abused the people, especially the poor. The Hebrews showed little appreciation for all God had done to them. They squandered opportunities that came their way. They did not think that all these things came from God. In some important ways, the blue and yellow flower in the story were very much like the people of Judah. Both were given equal gifts. They were radiantly beautiful. 
Both as well, we were provided the opportunity to do something today to prepare for tomorrow. The blue flower was complacent and missed the occasion to work now in order to prepare for the future. We need to prepare for the future. Destruction was a result. The yellow flower, on the other hand, exercised their gifts wisely and fully in the process created a whole sea of yellow blossoms. The people of Judah, unfortunately, acted like the blue flower. They were complacent. Even more than complacent, however, they misused the gifts God has given them, has provided them to use. They misused those gifts. Because the people did not produce good fruit, God's judgment is proclaimed on the nation. The hedge and the wall, the symbolic in God's protection for the nation and its people, will be removed, which means the hedge will be totally removed because there is no need for putting a hedge for unproductive vine trees. God will allow briars and thorns to overrun the vineyard, a symbol that the nation of Judah will be conquered by pagan people. Lest we think that the story of the flowers and the song of the vineyard are not applicable to our contemporary situation. We must examine our own lives and see how we have used the men and wonderful gifts God has given us. God does not ask too much from us, but the Lord does command that we exercise our potential. We are prepared for what may come and use our gifts wisely. So the issue is, the very first thing is, what has God given you? Are you using what God has given you? Or are you always complaining, doing the wrong thing, instead of following what God has commanded you to do? We have all received many wonderful gifts, but we have exercised our potential with what we have been given. If we exercise our potential with what we have been given, we have all been given the gift of faith. This great gift from God is well defined in the letter of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 1. Going onward, as assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We have been given the gift of faith, but we have used, have we used it to its full potential? If we have got the gift of faith, have we used it? When our faith is tested, do we give in to temptation? Do we give up the situation when it looks bleak? Such as sickness, unemployment, or problems at work, home, everywhere. When we succumb to sickness, do we lose our hope, our faith? Or do we demonstrate our faith and trust God, as did Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, and other great biblical figures of faith? Do we share our great gifts of faith with those not as privileged as ours? Do we share it with others? We have all been given many talents in the classroom as students and as teachers, on the athletic field as players and coaches, in the arts as musicians or patients, in the professional world as physicians, engineers, architects. How would we answer Jesus when he says, from everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom he has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. In Luke 12, verse 48. Does the world, whether it is be our family, a place of business, or our church, receive some compensation and benefit from all we have been given? Do we show gratitude to God by giving back some of what we have been given? So often we squander all we have been given, or we use poorly or wisely the manifold gifts of God. The Lord's gifts are bestowed upon us for our benefit and the good of all. We should not seek some compensation or a reward for what we do, but rather be content to do what God of us, realizing that the gifts we truly seek are not of this world. We've been given by God. As Jesus said, when you have done all that you have been ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. In Luke 17, verse 10, as God who loves what he has made, who is invented in creation, God longs for love to be retained and asks for potential to be realized and yes, for righteousness and justice from those whom God has created. Yes, God has got expectations. Like any lover, God has got expectations. 
When those expectations are not met, God is not free from pain and disappointment. He's being disappointed because he has got a lot of expectations. Just like us, we've got expectations when we send our children to school. When Whatever we do, we have got expectations. And sometimes we suffer those expectations in disappointment. We know what all that is like, don't we? We know what it's like to give ourselves to another and have that love rejected. You try to give love to someone and you are being rejected. We know what it's like when someone we care about disappoints us. We know what it's like when even our best efforts don't seem to be good enough. We know what it's like. As any gardener knows, sometimes the plants just don't grow. You do everything. You put everything in the soil. You put everything. There was a year I did everything in my garden. And I couldn't get what I, I was looking for. The yield that I was expecting, it did not happen. The soil is fine. There is enough sunlight, water, and care. But the plants don't grow. Is that the gardener's fault? That is the question. Is that the gardener's fault? Sometimes children make a bad choice. Is that the parent's fault? Sometimes a spouse makes a wrong decision. Is that the partner's fault? Sometimes a friend takes a mistake course of action. Is that your fault? The vineyard owner did everything he could for his vineyard. The grapes were still wild and unmanageable. Is that his fault? No. No, it's not. At some point, we have to be responsible for what we have done or what we haven't done. We need to take responsibility somehow. At some point, we have to accept responsibility for the mistakes we have made. We need to take responsibility. The wild and manageable grapes are not the fault of the vineyard owner. Who did all that he could? The child's bad choice is not the fault of the parent who did all she could or he could. The wrong decision by a spouse is not the fault of a partner or who did all that he could. The mistake action of a friend is not your fault if you did all you could. God knows it's not your fault. And no, God knows it's not God's fault at all. It's your choice sometimes. All of us children and parents, husband and wives, friends and lovers, have a responsibility for what we do and who we are. We are responsible to ourselves, responsible to one another, responsible to God. Responsibility is one of our least favorite ways. Isn't it? We'd much rather cast the blame than accept the responsibility. I've asked several questions to some of my children, and they don't want to take responsibility. They always have to blame someone for what they've done. But you are the one who have done this, not someone else. They will always try to say, I did this because someone caused me to do it. They don't want to take responsibility. It's my parents' fault. It's my minister's fault. It's my teacher's fault. It's my parents' fault. It's my friend's fault. It's God's fault. It's the technical fault. It's always someone else. It's always someone else and something else. But sooner or later, we have to realize that we are who we are because of what we have done. Because of choices we have made and actions we have taken. We have followed twisted paths and worshipped false gods and brought all this upon ourselves. There are consequences to the wild wildness of the vines, just as there are consequences to the waywardness of our lives. Our bad choices and poor decisions, mistaken actions have consequences. Just know that in this passage, the vineyard is torn down and trembled. If you read it very well, the disappointed owner tears it up. It is utterly destroyed. God knows the consequences of failing to meet the vineyard's owner's expectations and quote in this verse, in Isaiah 5, verse 5 and 6. Bad choices can end relationships. Poor decision can wreck families. Mistaken actions can ruin marriages. 
Bowing down to false gods can deplete our souls. Worshipping idols can destroy us. Following bad friends can destroy your life, can ruin your career. And that is, those are the things we need to know. These are serious consequences. God knows the consequences are serious, yet we are feeble. Our best efforts are frequently infective. Our inabilities have serious consequences. God knows that. But God also knows that there is no consequence that cannot be redeemed. No choice so bad. No decision so poor. No action so mistaken that God cannot forgive it and even use it to transform your own life and change your life. So what does God do? In the rub of our failures and mistakes, the God who will not give up on us send his son Jesus Christ, a Lord to worship, a savior to hold, a teacher to learn from, one of peace and wisdom and salvation, one we cannot be found anywhere else, one from the very heart of God. God loved the world. And what did he do? He sent his only son. That whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God planted Jesus in the vineyard of the earth. And Jesus says to all of us under the burden of responsibility and consequences, I am the vine. He's pointing to himself. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from you, you can do nothing. In John 15 verse 5. Can you hear now? The movement has changed. It's now Jesus who is now the vineyard. So that he can change your life. So when you surrender your life and you give your life to Jesus, who is the true vine, you will live a better life. At last the vineyard owner has found a way to grow good grapes. At last there is a way for us to flourish as our creator intends. At last there is a way to redeem our failings and restore our souls. At last there is a way to escape the tyranny of idols who demand much to provide nothing. The way out is Jesus Christ. He is a true vine. At last, the vineyard is beautiful and productive as the grapes are formed and nourished by the vine from the heart of God, Jesus Christ. Ducking in responsibility and railing from the consequences, what we have done these days and this life often feel wild and unimaginable. God knows there is another way. God knows we need it. And that's why he sent his only son, who is the true vine, for us to follow for us to abide in him. Let us be wise and exercise properly, fully and for the betterment of God's people, the great gifts we have received. May we reject complacent and the temptation to abuse others with the gifts we have. Let us follow the example of Christ who came not to be saved, but to save and give life, life as a ransom for many in Matthew 20 verse 28. Our reward in heaven will be great. May we know that we have the potential, learning to maximize your potential. God help you as you journey in this Christian journey, as you journey in your future, know that you can do something better. Not just better, you can be the, do the best you can because you have the potential to do it. May God bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Let us um, pray. Glorious God, you pour so much blessing into our lives. If only we will look out for it. The sun that shines, the rain that falls, the air we breathe, the world around us, the people we love, the people who love us, and just that the beginning. Please help us to tend to you, to respond to your love, to open our hearts to you, and produce good, health fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us...
pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, you have done everything in our lives. Because you have done everything in our lives. You expect a return of something to you. It is time for us to give back. Time to give the things that God has given. Time to bring our tithes. Time to bring our offerings. As a way of saying thank you, Lord, for all the things you have given us. And we really want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for everything. May you continue to bless us. May you continue, Lord, to show us your love. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you too, brother.